Chapter 5 of Severin's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Bowie. The Gerard Saint Mystery and Other Wild Tales by John Charles Dent. Severin's Disappearance. Chapter 5. One Hundred Pounds Reward. Mrs. Severin sat up waiting for her lord until long past midnight but her vigil was in vain. Lapierre, after closing up his inn for the night, dropped in, according to his promise, to see if any news of the absentee had arrived. Nothing further could be done in the way of searching for the latter personage until daylight. It was getting on pretty well towards morning when Mrs. Savarine sought her couch, and when she got there her slumber was broken and disturbed. She knew not what to think, but she was haunted by a dread that she would never again see her husband alive. Next morning, soon after daylight, the whole neighborhood was astir, and the country round was carefully searched for any trace of the missing man. Squire Harrington went down to town and made inquiries at the bank, where he ascertained that the story told by Savarine to old Jonathan Perry, as to his altercation with Suttleworth, was substantially correct. This effectually disposed of any possible theory as to Jonathan and his wife having mistaken someone else for Savarine. Squire Harrington likewise learned all about the man's doings on the previous afternoon, and was able to fix the time at which he had started for home. He had ridden from the door of the peacock at about a quarter to eight. This would bring him to the toll gate at eight o'clock, the hour at which the Perry professed to have seen and conversed with him. There was no longer any room for doubt. That interview and conversation had actually taken place at eight o'clock on the previous evening, and Severine had ridden northward from the gate within five minutes afterwards. He could not have proceeded more than a hundred, or, at the very outside, two hundred, yards further, or he must inevitably have been encountered by Lapierre. How had he contrived to vanish so suddenly out of existence? And it was not only the man, but the horse, which had disappeared in this unaccountable manner. It seemed improbable that two living substances of such bulk should pass out of being and leave no trace behind them. They must literally have melted into thin air. No, they hadn't. At least the black mare hadn't for she was discovered by several members of the searching party a little before noon. When found, she was quietly cropping the damp herbage at the edge of the cranberry swamp at the rear of Squire Harrington's farm. She was wholly uninjured, and had evidently spent the night there. The bit had been removed from her mouth, but the bridle hung intact round her neck. The saddle, however, like its owner, had disappeared from her back. Then the man began a systematic search in the interior of the swamp. They soon came upon the saddle, which had apparently been deliberately unbuckled, removed from the mare, and deposited on a dry patch of the ground, near the edge of the morass. A little farther in the interior they came upon a man's coat, made of dark brown stuff. This garment was identified by one of the pa party as belonging to Savarine. It was wet and besmirched with mud, and in fact was lying half in and half out of a little puddle of water when it was found. Then the searchers made sure of finding the body. But in this they were disappointed. They explored the recesses of the swamp from end to end and side to side with the utmost thoroughness, but found nothing further to reward their search. The ground was too soft and marshy to retain any traces of footsteps, and the mare and saddle furnished the only evidence that the object of their quest had been in the neighborhood of the swamp, and of course this evidence was of the most vague and inconclusive character. Then the party proceeded in a body to the missing man's house. Here another surprise awaited them. The coat was at once recognized by Mrs. Savarine as belonging to her husband, but it was not the coat worn by him at the time of his disappearance. Of this there was no doubt whatever. In fact, he had not worn it for more than a week previously. His wife distinctly remembered having folded and laid it away in the top of a large trunk on the Saturday of the week before last, since which time she had never set eyes on it. Here was a deepening of the mystery. The search was kept up without intermission for several days, nearly all of the farmers in the vicinity taking part of it, even to the neglect of the harvest work which demanded their attention. Squire Harrington was especially active, and left no stone unturned to unravel the mystery. Lapierre gave up all his time to the search, and left the royal oak to the care of its landlady. The local constabulary bestirred themselves as they had never done before. Every place, likely and unlikely, where a man's body might possibly lie concealed, every tract of bush and woodland, every barn and outbuilding, every hollow and ditch, every field and fence corner, was explored with careful minuteness. 
even though wells of the district were peered into and examined for traces of the thirteen stones of humanity which had so unaccountably disappeared from off the face of the earth. Dr. Scott, the local coroner, held himself in readiness to summon a coroner's jury at the shortest notice. When all of these measures proved unavailing, a public meeting of the inhabitants was convened, and funds were subscribed to still further prosecute the search. A reward of one hundred pounds was offered for any information which should lead to the discovery of the missing man, dead or alive, or which should throw any light upon his fate. Handbills proclaiming this reward, and describing the man's personal appearance, were exhibited in every barroom and other conspicuous place, throughout Westchester and the adjacent townships. Advertisements setting forth the main facts were inserted in the principal newspapers of Toronto, Hamilton, and London, as well as in those of several nearest county towns. All to no purpose, days, weeks, months passed by, and furnished not the shadow of a clue to the mysterious disappearance of Reginald Birchier, Savarine, on the night of Monday the 17th of July, 1854. End of Chapter 5, 100 Pounds Reward Recording by Alex Bowie Woodbridge, Virginia.